All right, so obligation to sell the stock at the strike price. Okay, so if I either had the stock, if I had the stock, or I had a choice to buy back the borrowed stock, I would no longer have unlimited risk. So what we're going to be talking about here is how can we change this from limited risk, unlimited risk to limited risk. And the way I could do that is by taking part of my 12 points, part of my 12 points and having the choice to buy the stock. So what I would strongly recommend to a customer, instead of doing a naked call, that what they might want to consider instead is a credit call spread. And that's what I'm about to show you, a credit call spread. And our first test question, our first test question is, can you identify a spread? A spread is long and short, the same type of contract. So if Dean is gonna turn this into a spread, you should be able to tell me on the answer set that I need a long call here because that's what a spread is. It's long and short, the same type of contracts. So what I'm telling you is so they could give you on the test, A, B, C, D, and then you would have to pick the choice that would turn that into a spread. For example, mm -hmm. maybe choice B says you short a put and that would turn it into a straddle, right? So by the way, even if identification isn't testable, I'm telling you it is, but even if it wasn't, I just told you it is. If you can't identify, you don't know what to do next, right? So I'm gonna take part of my money. And I'm gonna go long, one apple, July. Uh, now I gotta decide whether I want to put it in the ceiling. You know, I have a floor here at 150 and I'm about to put it in the ceiling. And I could put in that ceiling at 160 or 165. I'm kind of trying to decide, you know, how much market action do I want to be exposed to? You know, a choice to buy back the stock, choice to buy the stock at a lower strike will give me greater protection. However, it will also cost me more money because lower strike call contracts always have greater premiums. So a choice to buy at 160 is going to cost me more than 165. I'll be cheap and I'll go for the 165 call. And let's say I can get that done for three. So test question number one is I have created a spread. A spread is when you're long and short, the same type of contract. So that's our first test question that what we've designed here is a spread. Now, the next uh, part of the test is really important. You know, because this is one of those common themes. If we end up paying for an option position, that's our max loss. And if we collect money, that's our maximum gain, right? So the next thing we want to determine is, are we buying the spread or are we selling the spread? Is this a debit spread, more money out than in? Or is this a credit spread? The spread, by the way, is the difference in those premiums, right? So is that three? Let's start with the three. Is that three money out or money in? Is that three money out or money in? Out. Eh. Oh, you're right. How bad is that? The instructor's messed up. That's bad. I better go get another cup of coffee. <laughs> Boom. And how about that 12? In. Right on. So this is a credit spread. That's really an important piece of the analysis. And that is what we're spreading is the difference in those premiums, right? So this is a net credit. This is a net credit of nine. That's the difference in those two numbers. Uh, personally, um, you could do this with a minus or plus if you want. You could put minus three plus 12 and that's plus nine. I'm not a big fan of using pluses and minuses because if you're not very consistent with that, then you're going to start, you know, transposing pluses and minuses and get kind of messy. So what I like to do instead 
is I like to use dollars out, dollars in, and I like to use a T perhaps if you don't want to do it the way I'm doing it here. Uh, by the way, this would be your process on your scratch paper. So they're not going to stack the, the uh, legs. These are called legs, not testable. They're not going to stack the legs for you. So you're going to have to do that in your scratch paper. They say your customer goes short, one apple, July 150, call at 12. And long, one apple, July 165, call at three, when apple's at 152. And then you've got to put that on your scratch paper. And as you know, Eric has been with me quite a while here. So I believe in almost in everything, whether it's options or margins, you do an initial setup. And that's what we're working on is getting this set up. By the way, maybe we've answered the question already. Maybe the question is like, what's the credit? I doubt it. But you know, if you do all the things that I'm going to be showing you how to do, then whatever they want to know, you've got my guarantee you have the answer. And so you want to be process driven. Just happened again today. I just literally, before we got on the phone, had a guy who was watching a video where I'm doing a spread, just like I did with you guys a minute ago. And I made a mistake and he sent me a nasty comment. And then he said, oh, I'm sorry, you caught yourself. And you know, if you have a process, I joked with him. I said, no problem. But the good thing about having a process, if you have some kind of a process, it's more likely you're going to catch yourself if you make a mistake. And, you know, otherwise, if you don't have a process, sometimes you'll make a mistake and you won't even know you made a mistake. If, you know, you'll feel good about your answer. And, you know, you didn't even know you recognize that you got it wrong. Now, if you want, again, I said you could also use debit. You know, you could use a minus sign, a plus sign. If you want, you can put credit over here, you know, however you want to go about. But if you can track money, and you're not struggling with contract specifications. What I mean by that is you're not fumbling around that that's an obligation to sell 100 shares of Apple at any time between now and July at 150, and you got 12 for that, and you can track money, then I think you're in pretty good shape. So as I said here, if you want, you don't have to do, the, do it next to the spread. I like to do it next to the spread, and I'll show you why. But if you want, and by the way, when you got lots of things going on, it's really important that you're disciplined in terms of tracking stuff. Right, so we've got a 150 call here. And I'm just gonna put that there with my T so we can track what's going on with that. Uh, was that an opening a purchase or an opening sale on that uh, 150 call? It's an opening sale. Right on, very testable. Opening sales are used to establish or add to short positions. Now, again, if you want, you can put a plus there. And again, you could also uh, put 900. I don't believe in putting 900 in there. I believe in doing things on a per share basis. And then when we're all done, seeing what's going on. Because otherwise you're going to have to continue to you know, put 900 and then 300 and then 15,000 and then 16,500. And it gets really messy really quickly. Whereas if you do it on a per share basis, it's just easier. Then when you're all done, you only have to multiply once, like times 100 or times 1,000, depending on how many we're doing. And then as I told you, I like to be kind of disciplined here about what I'm looking at. And so I'm going to put my 165 call there. And so you can either just do it on the uh, on your scratch paper next to the premiums, uh, next to the legs, or you can do what I'm doing here, which is kind of putting it in my T. But in, uh, anyways, oh, by the way, Dean made another mistake again. Boy, I better stop making up things on the fly, right? Let's see. Boom, that should be 12. By the way, and I caught myself again because I'm using the T. You know, when you're using the T, it doesn't match up. You say, oh, I must have made some kind of a mistake. All right, so then that's three. So uh, there's eight things you got to know about a spread, and we're working on a couple of them. So I told you the first test question we have to be able to do is identify the spread. And then the next thing we got to be able to do is determine debit or credit. Now, if we get debit or credit, we can really rock and roll. So we've established that this is a credit spread, and that's going to be important for our analysis Boom, and let's just put that here. This is a net credit. Net means, whatever there's net, by the way, what you do is you, uh, it means you do the difference, right? So, you know, if it's if it, here, it's like a straddle, buy, buy, sell, sell, you're gonna, you know, combine them. But when it's a difference, you're going to net them. That's what net means. And that's the spread, net credit. Okay, so this is the position in my account. This is the position in my account. And my broker calls me and he says, Dean, the contracts expired. The contracts expired. So that means there's zero, right? If they expire, that's if Apple is 150 or lower. And so if these contracts expire, would I be happy or would I be sad if these contracts expired? Happy. Happy. Yeah, yeah I get to keep the $900, right? 
I mean, the big guess, best case when you sell options is that you agree to be a potential victim and nobody victimizes you. I mean, you get to go neener, neener, neener. So that's, by the way, that's the, the difference. But now is zero, right? They're both zero. That's the most that they can narrow to get smaller is zero. So expire is good. Now, even if you don't get that, credit expire and narrow go together all the time. So, you know, again, if you're struggling with options, you want to be menu driven. You want to stay menu driven. So, you know, expire. Some people like to know that expire has six letters. Credit has six letters. And narrow is the hardest part to get. And narrow means the difference in the premiums. I just gave you an example where the difference narrowed from nine to zero, right? What I mean by that is we look here. When we did the spread, the difference was, let me go smaller. In here. When we uh, did the spread, the difference was nine. And now the difference is zero. And that's why we made nine points. That's the most it could narrow to is when they're both worthless. Again, I wouldn't worry too much about that because again, credit expire narrow, go together all the time. You will be right every time. All right, so we've done now four of the things we're held accountable for. We're held accountable for identifying this as a spread. We're held accountable for determining whether it's a debit or credit. We're held accountable for knowing it. Uh, we want the contracts to expire and we want the difference in the premiums to narrow. We said that's the hardest part to get. Don't need to get it because it goes together all the time. The next thing we got to be able to do is max gain, max loss. Now, I think of uh, spreads, what Dean thinks of is not testable, but I think of the uh, spreads is about having a floor and a ceiling. What I mean by that is there's a floor here at 150. And there's a ceiling at 165. You know, all the action takes place between these strikes. You know, that's the whole point of a spread. As I'm saying, I want to play between 150, 165. I don't want to play no more. So that can help us as a test taker. Because when we're looking for max gain or max loss, the two numbers have to add up to 15 points. There's only 15 points to be made or lost. So, you know, if you go down the memory road, what I mean by going down the memory road, the amount of stuff you're going to have to memorize is going to continue to expand. And so I think as a test taker, it's easier for me to know that the max gain and the max loss has to add up to 15 because that is the whole point of a spread is I'm saying I wanna play between 150 and 160 and then I don't wanna play no more. And so, you know, the reason that's helpful is because we know the two numbers add up to the difference in the strikes. And I already have one of those numbers. I already have one of those numbers. One of the number I have is the max gain because we said if the contracts expire, we're going to keep the money. So nine plus something, nine plus something equals 15. Now, if you don't get that, yuck. If you don't get that, then you're going to have to memorize. And I just think this is a pain in the butt. You're going to have to memorize that the maximum gain in a credit spread is the difference in the strikes less the net credit. I think that's just a mental mess. I think it's easier to say, okay, well, something plus nine equals 15. Something plus nine equals 16. And what is that something? That something is six. Now, again, stay menu driven, but when you get the menu done, then you can think about it. You can say, okay, well, the worst case now is I buy the apple at 165, I sell the apple at 150, and I uh, lose 15 points, but I have nine in my account, and so I lose six. By the way, remember, that's much better than a naked call, right? The naked call, remember, before we uh, rolled into the spread, the maximum loss was unlimited. So we collected uh, 12, and we could lose everything. Remember, the original position before we legged into the spread Again, conversation is not testable, but we said that this was just foolish, right? Because if you just do that, that has unlimited risk. 
And so he said, well, gee, we really want to take that 12 points, but we're smart enough to know that if we just take the 12 points and we don't do anything else, we're going to have some serious potential problems. So being Thank the smart you. bears that we are, we decided to take part of our money and buy that higher strike uh, call contract. Yes. Does this work for every contract, uh, um, the max the max loss? Yep, yeah, yeah, always. And you're going to get one of the numbers right off the bat by netting the premium. So if it's a debit, that's the loss. This is a credit, that's the gain. So you're going to have one of the numbers when you net the premiums right out of the gate. You're either going to have a debit and that's the loss or you're going to have a credit and that's the gain. So then you can, by the way, bad form is a test taker to tell me any two numbers. You can, by using this trick, you can get a 50-50. Right. What I mean by that is you can chop the answer set if you're being asked max gain, max loss, and toss out any two numbers that don't add up to 15. That'll give you now a 50-50, right? Maybe a choice A is 8 and 7, that adds up to 15, and D is 9 and 6, and that adds up to 15. So you got two choices that add up to the difference of the strikes. The other two don't add up to 15, so they can't be right. It's got to be two numbers that add up to the, the difference here. That's what's going on, by the way. Now we have to do our break, even another test-taking trick. The break even has to be somewhere between 150 and 165. So as we shop our answer set, we can toss out anything offered to us that isn't somewhere between 150 and 165. Now I have a memory aid device for us when it comes to call spreads. Now remember, before we turned it into a call spread, it was 150 plus 12, it was 162. But you know, we don't have a 12 point cushion anymore. And so the memory aid device we can use is Cal. And that's to remind us that in a call spread, we're gonna do call add to the lower. Call add to the lower. So we're gonna take our lower strike 150 and we're gonna add the net premium to that to get our break even. So call add to the lower. So the lower strike here is 150. And so we're gonna take 150 plus nine. And we get our break even of 159. Now again, stay menu driven. Stay menu driven. You know, if I look at the dominant leg here, if I look at the dominant leg, the dominant leg is always the leg not Tesla, these are called legs. It has the larger premium. That is my dominant leg. And in a call spread, it will always be the lower strike call because it has the greater premium. So, you know, if I have to deliver the stock at 150, right, because that's what I have an obligation to do, I would bring in 150. I'm just illustrating that indeed this is the break even, right? So if I get 150 for the stock, and I have to go in the market and buy it at 159 to deliver it at 150, I lose nine points. However, I have nine points. If you see the columns there, I have the same dollars out as dollars in. That's what break even is, by the way. Break even is same dollars out as dollars in. I'm illustrating that indeed that would make it break even. So if you get good at the T, what I'm suggesting is that. Whatever is offered to you as a break even, you can kind of plug it in and muddle around and see does it make the columns balance? Because that's what break even is same dollars out or just dollars in. Now, I said the last thing we got to be able to do, the last thing we got to be able to do is determine bullish or bearish. And so, did you catch how I said we determine bullish or bearish? Now, again, I know that some of you may be doing options in a different way than Dean does them. But uh, do you, any of you guys using the matrix? Anybody using the matrix? The matrix, it, the matrix is the box. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. It's not a box. It's a matrix. Every yes. quadrant somehow has a relationship. So yes, I use that? that. So the other way, the reason I ask is you're using the matrix. That's very helpful in determining whether you're bullish or bearish because those are our sandboxes, right? There's our sandboxes, and we're trying to decide what sandbox we're in. And so I can look at my matrix and say, over here, I'm a 12. And over here, I'm a three. And so what sandbox am I really playing? And I'm playing in this short call box, right? So, bearish. Right? so that's important, by the way, because it's testable. And we need to know where we want Apple to be in relationship 
to 159. We want it to be down. We're bearish on Apple. By the way, we're smart bears. We're smart bears because we're smart enough to know if we just do a naked call that that would be very, very foolish. All right, so let's review. We'll go all the way back and we will review. These are so even if we didn't have premiums, we'd be able to tell yeah. that the dominant leg is the short leg because oh. the always call price is lower. Strike. Yeah, lower strike calls always have greater premiums. So let's just show you that. Well, let me review it, then I'll show it to you. Sure. So, yep. uh, if premium's not listed, yeah, the lower strike call will always be the dominant leg, always. And then the higher, Along, the higher yeah. for puts, right? That's exactly right. So, okay, so we've uh, remember, this would be a very foolish dumb bear. We agreed that was a very dumb bear. Everybody agree that's a dumb bear? Of all the bears in the woods, that's the dumbest bear out there because that has unlimited risk. And you don't want to be, you know, you know, I joke as a bear, you want to pick up the, you know, steal the picnic basket, but not, you know, get shot. So we decided that we were going to implement a spread. Test question number one. The spread is when you're long and short, the same type of contract. So we implemented a call spread. The next thing we had to be able to do was determined debit or credit. So we netted the premiums and we established that this was a nine point credit spread. We also did that in the T and we call this our initial setup. And we said, that's really important because if you get that credit or debit, this case credit, you can rock and roll because once you get credit, you know expire, you know narrow and you know your max gain. So you can really rock and roll. We said we have to be able to do the break even and we, our max gain, max loss, we said the max gain, the max loss always equals the difference in the strikes. The max gain, max loss always equals the difference in the strikes. So there's 15 points to be made or lost. Of the 15 points, we've collected nine, so we can only lose six. Now, if you don't get that, then you got to memorize. The maximum loss in a credit spread is the difference in the strikes less than that credit. I just think that's a mental mess, but you know. However you get there, you, you need to get there. And then we have to do break even. Are we going to use Cal or push? We're going to use Cal. Call, add to the lower. We're going to take the lower strike. We're going to add the net premium. Doesn't matter whether that's a debit or credit. Net premium to get our break even to 159. And then remember, the next thing we got to do is determine where we need it in relationship to that. And we said the larger premium dominates. Now, I told you I would show you this. And so let me just show you that. The question was, and you were correct, that you should be able to figure this out even if I don't show you these premiums because lower strike calls always have greater premiums. So without the premiums, that's going to be the dominant leg. So if I do the reveal and now it's a short call, then it's going to be a bearish and it's going to be a credit call spread. And if I do the reveal and that's the one we're buying, the 150, it's going to be a debit call spread. You know, So we yeah, we should be able to kind of figure that out with missing premiums. You know, they, they have a couple questions like that on the exam where you, it's missing the premiums, right? Uh, you can't actually do the break even all that without the premiums. You can certainly tell me that the lower strike call is dominant. And then once I, I show you this, I do this reveal. With, whoop. I do that reveal. Now you can tell me that's a credit call spread. You can't tell me what the net is without the premiums, but you can tell me that's a credit call spread or, or should be able to tell me that's a credit call spread. Right, so, all right, so, uh, the, Erica, that was an advanced option strategy. Uh, let's see, we have three people for our office hour. Does anybody want to do something different, or you want to do another spread, or what do you guys want to do? Um, can I just ask you a question sure. about how much effort to put? So, the book and the lesson spends a lot of time on what happens to option contracts if there's a stock split or reverse stock split yeah, or a dividend. Yeah, totally test prep vendor. I yeah, mean, and I've yet to see it ever come up on any of my practice tests. No, so no, I just no, don't know I, if it. I so I I I'm starting to do a podcast, and here the reason I'm doing the podcast is because. Uh, there's things I would like to talk about, but I have the channel organized by series. So there's not really a place for Dean to rant <laughs> so, sure. you know, sure. about things that aren't test related, but are more of a general topic. So here's here's what has, has happened. And it, it drives me nuts, nuts with test prep vendors. So in the old days, the series seven was two, three hour sessions. Mm -hmm. It was uh, 250 questions. And there was all kinds of minutia like that, that was on the test. 
And then when the FINRA, you know, I'm dating myself, but, you know, in the old days, we wanted to be the few and the proud, not the many and the humble. And that Series 7 is a barrier to entry. And that barrier to entry in the industry, you guys might not feel that, you guys and gals, but it, you know, it's it's not the barrier it once was. There's a lot of minutia that isn't there, but nobody wants to call their, either their QBank or their, their manual. Because I get it, right? It's like even me, you know, I pride myself on having so many practice questions for you guys. And nobody wants to say I got less questions, you know, this year than last year. So none of the test prep vendors have called their, their study materials for those esoteric things. Like, for example, I have a, a lecture on memory aids and people go, oh, you don't have pro golfers don't miss or pretty girls day more. I said, because it hasn't been on the test in years. <laughs> you know, so that's why it's not there. You know, yeah. oh, you don't have mill rates on calculating property tax. I go, because it hasn't been there in years. So your point, wait, they're guilty on that. So the answer to your question is no, you shouldn't worry about that at all. By the way, if I was lying, I always like when we have victorious take test takers join us on the live stream. If I were lying to you, I have no reason to do that. But somebody would pop up on Reddit or something and say, you told me it wasn't there and it was there. You know? sure. So, sure. so you, you have to kind of take my word for a little bit. But the other two areas that I think test prep vendors really uh, overdose is margin and partnerships. I mean, oh my God. Now, back in the day, <laughs> back in the day, there were 15 questions on partnerships and there were, you know, 10, 11 questions on margin. But, you know, my God, the past perfect, you know, I, you know, everybody, all test prep vendors are guilty of this. But boy, past perfect, I think, is the most guilty member of this. I mean, my God, you know, I think Erica has bad for her. She'll send me a past perfect question every now and again. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> Uh, so it depends who your vendor is. So, uh, but yeah, so I hope that answers your question. And by the way, same thing, whether it's an office hour, email or live stream, you're always welcome to get confirmation like that and just say, Hey Dean, before I go down this rabbit hole, is it worthwhile? I told you, I just really, I, I was just shouting uh, praises, uh, giving uh, flowers to Erica because I was really worried about her on the SIE because her test prep vendor was giving her questions and she was sending them to me. I was helping her with them. But I thought, oh man, I hope Erica doesn't spend too much time on this because there's so many other things that, you know, you need to get. <laughs> you know, so, so that can yeah. be a challenge. And, and it's particularly a challenge when people, like I just talked to a guy today, a tutoring session for you guys, and he just barely missed. And boy, those scores hurt. And I think that bar barely missed could be just that, like you just a misallocation of time and you're you're becoming, uh, you know, intellectually sound on things you're not going to get tested on. I mean, that's that's the problem, right? Yeah. Okay. Hey, Great. Dean, Thank I you. have a, a question for you. Mm -hmm. One, what is it? And then two, is it testable? Yeah. Can you just cover double barrel bonds and also lease rental bonds? Sure. I sure can. And this is testable. And, uh, you know, I know you guys, your ladies are going to be surprised, but I have haters. And, uh, you know, it drives me nuts because people who don't use me use other people. And sometimes I feel like, man, I wish I could help you because you're going down a road that not be good, right? So I'm more than happy to talk about that. So first thing, munis is very testable. Munis are very testable. I would suggest that at some point you take a sheet of paper and you fold it in half and on one side, write all the terms associated with geos and revenues, right? Geos and revenues. Because a big part of the exam is gonna be distinguishing between geos and revenues. Now, if you break into my home, if you break into my home and I tell you I have a double barreled shotgun, I'm telling you that if I miss you with the first shot, I'm going to get you with the second shot. And so, you know, where people were getting hung up with, I saw this whole thing where people were kind of mixed up, is they were confusing moral obligation bonds with double barrel bonds and they're entirely different things. So, you know, in a double barrel bond, the first pledge the first pledge is the user fee. And if the user fees are insufficient, the second pledge, the second barrel, is the full faith and credit of the municipality. So the first pledge is a user fee, and the second pledge is the full faith and credit. Notice that I'm putting it in the geo category because that's where it belongs. You know, it belongs over here, uh, the example, you know, and this, the people who were confused about this, uh, I wish uh, somebody would have given an example of the confirmation you would receive when you buy a bond like this. So let me give you an example. You know, Salt Lake City wanted to host the Olympics. And so uh, they formed the Salt Lake City Olympic Organizing Committee. 
And they uh, first proposed issuing a $300 million in revenue bonds. You know, where they would say the user fees from the Olympics will pay the interest in the principal. And their public finance guy, you know, at major firms, we have public finance and we have corporate finance. Corporate finance are men and women who raise money for corporations. Public finance are men and women who raise money for cities, states, counties, school districts, airports. Anyways, he said, listen, if I go out to the capital markets to raise this money for you and all there is is a user fee from the Olympics, I'm not going to be able to place the bonds because for every host city where it's been a financial success, I can show you another city where it's been a financial disaster. And so what I think we're going to have to do is make this a double barrel bond. This does require test question. It's in this category. It's going to require voter approval. So they went to the citizens of Salt Lake and said, hey, how would you like to host the Olympics? You know, 77% of them said, let's do it. Now, here's where we can find out what kind of bond. On your confirmation, this would have said Salt Lake City Olympic Organizing Committee revenue bonds, comma, a general obligation of the city of Salt Lake. Please note, a general obligation of the city of Salt Lake. So that means, good news, there was a surplus. But if there had not been a surplus, if there had been a deficiency, what would have happened to your property taxes in Salt Lake? They would have gone up by whatever is necessary to pay back those bonds, right? So that is a double barrel bond. It says a comma, then as I said on your confirmation, it would say comma, a general obligation of the city of Salt Lake. By the way, it does require voter approval, right? Because, you know, the residents have to say, yeah, we, we get it. So that's a double barrel bond on the test. You would tell me that that is a geo bond. You're going to put it in the geo category. Now, I know there's some people who disagree with Dean on that, but because I've been doing this for decades and helped thousands of people pass their tests. So, you know, uh, that's where it belongs. If I ask you what kind of bond that is, I could test you this way. I could say, does it require voter approval? It most certainly does, right? It most certainly does. Now let's go to this next one over here. The moral obligation I have over on the revenue side. You know, for example, uh, maybe it's a hospital uh, district. And a lot of rural hospitals really struggle financially because, you know, a lot of people don't want to use the rural hospital. They want to go to the big city doctor and big city hospitals. And so uh, maybe it's the John C. Fremont Hospital Revenue District. Uh, hospital Revenue District. And they want to issue some bonds. Maybe they want to issue $10 million worth of bonds to modernize, update, and expand that rural hospital. And they go to the state of California or whatever state it is, Wisconsin, whatever, and says, hey, can we issue these bonds with the state's moral obligation? And the state says, yes. Now, if you buy these bonds, they say on the confirmation, John C. Fremont Hospital Revenue District bonds, comma, a moral obligation of the state of California. That is not a double barrel bond. It does not require voter approval. Now, if these bonds default, they're gonna to go to state legislature and they're gonna take a vote. They're gonna say, ladies and gentlemen, all in favor of paying back the moral obligation bondholders of the hospital district say aye. All opposed say no. If there's more yes, 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 and no's, you get paid back. That's called legislative apportionment, that process of taking the vote. They have a, a pretty good track record. But are we clear? That is not. That is not a general obligation bond. That goes in the revenue category. As I said, I think that's where a lot of test takers struggle. There's only two types of bonds, GOs and revenues. Now, granted, there are a zillion subcategories. But at the end of the day, it's either a GO or revenue. Now, you brought up one other bond that goes over here, and this is called a lease rental. And then on all the revenue bonds, by the way, it's the same test question. If the person abandons the lease, you know, if there's a lease and they abandon the lease, the bonds are going to default. Now, it depends whether who has the lease. You know, it's different if this is the city and they are agreeing to lease back like the uh, the operations yard for the uh, muni buses. That's different than if the lease is, uh, you know, a sports team in a stadium or a corporation and we're leasing back to them a factory. That would be different, right? So if it's a corporation... It's called an industrial development revenue bond. 
you know, sometimes on the desk, we might call this an IDB or an IDR. You know, uh, who knows, I'll ever get to teach live classes again, but someday perhaps. Uh, but, you know, uh, Schwab has an 80 acre corporate campus in uh, Lone Tree in Colorado. And, uh, you know, the uh, city of Denver said, hey, Schwab, why don't you come here and uh, put your Schwabies here? 4,000 employees. We could use 4,000 white collar employees in Denver. And they said, if you'll come to uh, Lone Tree, we'll build that campus to your specifications ready to occupy. And Schwab says, wow, sounds wonderful. Now, first test question is corporate credit backs that bond. You know, and Schwab's corporate credit is pretty good. You know, single A's, right? So that's that's important. That's very testable, right? Uh, I usually use the example of Boeing and they uh, had their leases up, by the way. So the bond, by the way, you want to tie the, <laughs> the bond's maturity to the lease. And so Chicago had built Boeing a corporate headquarters in Chicago. And now the lease is up and they're talking about moving again. Anyways, and when they did this, uh, Chicago's credit quality at the time was double B and Boeing's is single A. So single A goes on the bonds, corporate grab backs the bonds. Uh, Gilroy, California built a motorcycle manufacturing facility and Gilroy is double A and the motorcycle company is not rated. Not rated goes on the bonds. So that's our first test question. The second test question is the IRS calls this a private activity bond. You know, the major beneficiary of these bonds that I've been bringing up is, is not, you know, the city of Gilroy or Denver or, you know, Chicago. It's Boeing, it's Schwab, it's the motorcycle company. And the other one that throws in this category is a stadium. You know, for example, we provided here in Vegas $500 million worth of public money to the Raiders to build that stadium. We issued $500 million worth of bonds and told the bondholders that the lease is payments that the Raiders make will pay the interest in principle. And again, if they don't, if the Raiders default the bond, I mean, default on the lease, the bonds will default. Uh, however, the only reason I'm bringing it up is it goes into this category I'm about to discuss with you. And that is called a public purpose, don't throw rocks on me, non-essential bond. It's not like building a high school. Now, the reason I bring these two bonds up is because if you are subject to the AMT, these are taxable. So it becomes a suitability question you know, I say, hey, listen, before I, you know, recommend these Raider, you know, stadium bonds to you, are you subject to the alternative minimum tax? So, okay, next, and we'll do that next. Um, I, I remember learning that if you're, if the test question mentions that it's a city that is backing it, then you know it's double-barreled, and if it's a state that's backing it, then you know that it's a moral obligation. Is that accurate? Yeah, do you think? I think so. I'm not trying to. I'm just in my own head playing that. I think so because, you know, you know, you could find, I guess, a practice question of contradict. I think that's would be okay because, yeah, moral obligation of the state. I just don't like that because states do issue geo bonds, and the, on the state there are propositions where we're voting for the issuance of a geo bond. So that's what I don't like about it. But a moral obligation bond would not, the, issue, the the person making the moral obligation to pay would be the state. I can't okay. imagine it would be, you know, a, a county or a, some other entity. So, yeah. So if they mention that it's a city that's going to, that they're building something and the city agrees to to back it if it fails, then we know it's double barreled because yeah. it could be yeah, moral obligation so. because the state legislature. Okay. Thanks. I think that works. All right. So uh, it looks like the next thing is. Recognizing debit, debit, credit, debit, put spreads without calculations. Well, we said that you are held accountable to do that. And so let's just put a couple up here. And the key to these, remember, is knowing that lower strike call contracts always have greater premiums. Lower strike call contracts always have greater premiums. So, you know, uh, here we go. Let's get some uh, options going. Before I even put debit or credit, let's just put, you know, uh, let's just put the contracts up here.
So you can do this from any kind of a perspective you'd like, but you know, if we're looking at the Apple calls, a choice to buy at 140 is more desirable than 150. So if you're going to go long, I'm using the long perspective, but if you're going to go long, right, that makes sense. It would cost you more. So we said we don't have whether we're going long or short, but we should know, we should know that lower strike call contracts always have greater premium. So that's going to be the greater premium. I haven't told you what we're going to do with it yet, but it doesn't matter. That's the one that's going to have the greater premium. Let's make that smaller. Lower strike call contracts always have greater premiums. In fact, maybe we just put that in there. Let's just spell it. So before we do anything, if we know that, which we should, we, I just said we should, we know that this is going to be the dominant leg. The lower strike call is always going to be the dominant leg. And we said that higher strike puts always have greater premiums. A choice to sell Apple at 150 is more desirable than a choice to sell Apple at 140. So higher strike puts, contracts always have greater premiums. So that means before I show you whether we're buying or selling, before I even show you that, we know that the dominant leg is always going to be in a spread, the higher strike put. And that's always going to be the case. So boom. So now what we got to do is tell you whether we bought or sold, which leg we bought or sold. Because remember, spread is we're going long and short the same type of contract. We're going long and short the same type of contract. So we're going to be long a contract. We're going to be short a contract. So let's say that I tell you on the test that uh, this is the one that we're going long. Let's get a bigger font here. And this is the one that we're going short. And then we know that this is the one that has the greater premium. And so indeed, that is a debit call spread. And you're right, it's bullish. Anytime, by the way, it's just a, a trick. But anytime you're long the lower strike, it's bullish. And a good way to remember that is bulls because you're long the lower strike. In any spread, if you are long the lower strike, it is bullish. It's just a trick, but it works all the time. You're not long the lower strike, you're bearish. Just a trick. Okay, let's look at the next one. No, you're not going to have to do retail sales per capita. Oh my God. <laughs> no, you're not going to have to do that. <laughs> um, you do have to have a general understanding that, you know, communities that are richer are probably going to have a better credit quality than communities that are not, but no. Anyways, uh, so now we got to decide which one I'll let you pick. Are we going to buy the 150 or sell the 150? Are we buying or selling the 150? Your choice. I remember yeah. that's going to be dominant. <laughs> what are we going to do? Yeah. Sell. We're going to sell it. Okay. So if we're going to sell it or go short that one, that's the dominant leg. And that's going to be the greater premium. All right, so we're going to put that uh, there. Boom. And that's going to have the greater premium there. And again, you can use your matrix or whatever you want to call it. The greater premium dominates, which in this case is a short put. And so this is a bullish, no, credit bullish. This is bullish. You're long the lower strike price. You want Apple to be 150 or higher so you can keep the money. This is a credit put spread and credit put spreads are bullish. That's a common mistake, by the way. Credit doesn't necessarily mean you're bearish. So this is not a bearish spread. This is a bullish spread. Yeah, a credit put spread is bullish. A credit put spread is bullish. So that's how we do it if it's missing the premiums. I have a whole video on What's the spread? It's an entire 30 minutes of playing this game. So, you know, uh, you can check it out if you'd like, but that's how you do it. So the big takeaways are to make sure you know the lower strike call is dominant and the higher strike put is dominant. By the way, let's just reverse it, right? So if we reverse it, 
you know, what doesn't change is that greater premium. It doesn't change, right? That That is going to be the greater premium regardless of what we do. So now this time, let's say we go short this one and we go along this one. And now it's going to be a credit spread. Right, let's say now we go along this one. And we go short this one. Now it's a debit put spread. You guys remember the lower strike calls the dominant leg and the higher strike put is the dominant leg. Okay, what else? Got anything else on your uh, thing for today in our office hour? Yes, always, Dean. Okay, what do you got? Can you go over... Um, I, I hear options is, is tied into suitability. So can you give an example of what that would look like? Well, well, yeah. So the two players and options, the two players and options are speculators and hedgers. So it's important for us to know what are you coming to the options market to do? Are you a speculator or are you a hedger? Uh, that's okay, Beth, if you can still hear us with your tech issues. I am recording this, and it will be available in the uh, office hour replay. All so, right, great. Or I can Thank send you. it to you directly. So uh, I'm trying not to record. You know, I, it's harder for me to send it when I put it on my computer. I'm not very technically literate. So if it's on Zoom, it's easy for me to send you copies. But I probably should keep all this kind of stuff on the Zoom server so I can just hit the button and it comes and goes to you. Anyways, all long right. story short. So uh, uh, do you want to speculate? Do you want to speculate or do you want to offset risk? Do you want to actively pursue risk, Erica? Or I want to have stock and you're trying to lay off risk? I want to speculate. Okay, so if you're going to speculate, that means you're just making a bet on the stock price. You're either making a bet on the price going up or the price going down. So that means you're either going to be bullish or you're going to be what? bearish bearish and one reason you might want to speculate using options is because it requires a lot less money than the stock position what i mean by that if we talk about apple and you bought 100 shares of apple at 150 that's fifteen thousand dollars but if you buy an apple call for nine that's nine hundred dollars right so that'd be one reason you might want to buy options all right so if you're bullish what are some options transactions that you might consider as a speculator um buy a call yeah you know but remember you also when you buy that call that call may be awful expensive so you might want to consider selling a higher strike call to help you pay for the lower strike call so you might want to consider besides a long call a debit call spread uh what else could we do as a bull sell a put yeah you could go short a put now remember you know the problem there is if you're wrong erica somebody can stick the stock to you you have an obligation to buy at the strike price. So you might want to consider taking part of your money from the short put and doing a credit put spread just in case. That way, if it blows up on you and somebody sticks it to you, you can stick it to the next guy. So those are some bullish transactions. So if you're a bull, you can do a long call. You can do a debit call spread. You can do a short put. You can do a credit put spread. What are some bearish things you might want to do? Uh, buy a put. Yeah, and that's a very, very smart bear. Of all the bears in the woods who are speculating on a declining stock price, shorting the stock, shorting the call, buying a put, this is a very smart bear. Because if you're wrong, you're just going to lose the what? Premium. You know, I was a speculator as well, Eric, and I went into this chat room. <laughs> I said, are there any bears in the woods? <laughs> and everybody in this chat room is raging bulls on this stock price. And I said, I'm a bear. And, you know, if you're a bear, you need to show yourself so we can do battle with these people. Anyways, uh, she said, I'm a bear. I said, oh, cool. I said, she goes, what have you done? I said, well, I haven't done anything yet, but I think what I'm going to do is buy the 40 puts. I'm going to establish the choice to sell the stock at 40. And, uh, you know, I'm looking at the premiums. It's going to be four points. That's going to cost me $4,000. And then she said, I sorted the 40 calls naked. I go, well, gee, of all the things, I'm not doing that. <laughs> you know, so, and then she said, I haven't told my husband. I go, ooh, DMI, you know. Now, she got lucky and the calls expired. But, you know, uh, I got lucky too and the puts, you know, worked out for me. But 
you know, that's just a smarter thing to do is buy the put. It's like buying a lottery ticket. If you don't win, you just lost your money, right? Now, if I want to reduce my cost, I can uh, sell a lower strike put to lower my out-of-pocket cost. So I might want to consider a debit put spread. Uh, what's the dumbest thing you can do as a speculator? What is the dumbest thing you can do as a speculator? Uh, sell a naked call. Yeah, that's just really not smart. I joke, that's like picking up nickels in front of bulldozers. <laughs> you know, long calls sound pretty good. How with limited risk would you like unlimited reward? A short call sounds really, really foolish. So I would strongly recommend that instead of doing a short call, you do a credit call spread. Because that way, if you're wrong and you know blows up, you can call it away from the at the higher strike. So those are all of our speculative strategies in terms of suitability. Now, I would tell you that if you're buying the option, you got to be right about three things. Direction, if you're buying. If you're buying volatility, if you're buying that call or buying that debit call spread, you have to be right about three, three things. Direction, up. How far up? Because you got to cover your out-of-pocket cost. And you got to be right about the timing. If you buy a put or you buy a put spread, you got to be right about direction, down. You got to be right about how far down because you got to cover your out of pocket costs. You got to be right about timing. If you're speculating on the short side, you're just hoping somebody screws it up. So if I'm selling the volatility, I say, I think you're going to be wrong, Eric. I'll take your money. So these are simply people who are making a bet on the stock price. Now, remember, hedgers are people who have, have, have a stock position. And you can either have a long stock position. What's the other position you can have at a brokerage firm? Uh, you can have a short stock position. Right on. Good job. And so in these two stock positions, you're either interested in generating additional income or you're interested in protection. So the suitability here is, is the person after income or are they after protection? Are they after income or protection? Because suitability would be what they would do. So if they're after income, they're listening to, we're looking to generate additional income, very testable suitability, they would do a covered call. A covered call is how you generate additional income on your stock position. That is very, very testable. And if they're interested in protection, they would buy a protective put, right? So they're going to go along the put. This was a, sh a short call, by the way, but you have the stock, right? So no problem. And then shorting the stock is just really not smart, right? Because if you just short the stock, you have unlimited risk. And so what you might want to do, what would you do to protect a short stock position? Uh, you would sell a call. No. In protection, you never sell options for protection. Never, never, never. For protection, you're never going to sell. You're always going to buy. Buy a put. <laughs> and you need a choice to buy back the borrowed stock. You need a protective call, right? Because you're afraid the stock is going to go up. And so you need something that'll take care of that, right? So that's how, by the way, that's a very smart thing to do because that changes it from unlimited risk to limited risk. So very key. So those are some of the suitability questions. All the suitability questions, by the way, uh, are you know part of understanding the product, right? What I mean by that is understanding the investment vehicle. You know, then you know, depending on your draw, you know, I could say, well, why would you buy the call instead of the stock? And you would say leverage, right? Making a little money do a lot. You know, uh, what's a way to have a minimum loss, right? When you pay the premium, you know, that might be a reason you do it because if you pay the premium wrong, you just lose it. So it could get a little more in depth on that, but uh, that's a general overview. Anything else uh, for this office hour? We're coming to a close on this office hour. Can you cover special taxes? Well, special taxes. So let's go back. Let's see if I have that whiteboard. So keyword to a special tax. Special tax. Whoop. Let me get back my whiteboard. Is It's not a general tax. It's a special tax. Sometimes we call them sin taxes. You know, sin taxes like alcohol, tobacco, uh, it could be when you come to Vegas, there's a special tax on your hotel room. 
And that goes into an escrow account to pay interest and principal. For the first test question about a special tax bond is it's a revenue bond, even though it says tax. And then the second thing is if the tax is insufficient, the bonds default. So keyword is special. You know, sometimes we call those sin taxes. Their taxes on, oh, for example, San Francisco, where I hail from, or well, I don't hail from there, but I spent most of my career there. Uh, San Francisco, uh, nobody spends more than San Franciscans per capita on booze, books, and fine dining. I joke, we're the most educated drunks in the country. And in my crowd, if you, I tell you, you have a drinking problem, oh my God, you have a drinking problem, because we're not the kind of people that normally would say that. My friend Johnny, I checked him into the alcohol rehab center, he felt pretty guilty. I said, well, Johnny, you shouldn't feel guilty because you and I paid for this place. He goes, what are you talking about? Uh, San Francisco hired Morgan Stanley to do a feasibility study feasibility study, revenue bond, about issuing some special tax bonds. And Morgan Stanley said, do you have a general tax on alcohol sold within San Francisco? And the city said, yeah, it brings in about 30 million a year. And then Morgan Stanley says, we don't want to mess with that. So that's a general tax going to the general budget. Based on the numbers you provided, we think you could issue some special tax bonds and tell the special tax bond holders that that special tax on alcohol will pay the interest in principal. Now, the problem with these special tax bonds, if people stop drinking or smoking or doing whatever they're doing, what's going to happen to the bonds? They're going to default, right? So again, it's a type of revenue bond. Is that what you were asking or is there a particular question you have on? Anything that will be on the on the exam, that's really- that's, Well, that's right. what I told you. So what's on the exam is knowing it's a revenue bond. Mm -hmm. It's not a general tax. General tax means general budget. Special tax means revenue. Mm -hmm. and if that special tax is insufficient, the bonds default. So if there's not enough people drinking and smoking, whatever the case may be, I joke about Vegas. We got to be careful, right? If we make those special taxes too high, people are going to stop coming to Vegas. Mm. You know, my dad just was visiting. He told me he thought the room was 150. And by the time he paid all the special taxes, it was 300. Now, those are taxes that aren't going to the general budget of Las Vegas or Clark County. Those are general taxes. That would be general budget geo bonds. These are special taxes going to that Legion Stadium or you know, whatever it happens to be. All right, anything else? Final question, um, certificate of participation. What is that? Uh, <laughs> well, that's, we're telling you as a bondholder how much of the evidence of how much you're gonna participate in the revenues from the facility or whatever it may be, uh, not testable at all. So good. Not testable. <laughs> okay. Anything else? Final question. Sorry, I know there's another person on, but I just wanted to know for the double barrel bonds, and maybe I missed it. How are they rated and traded? Well, they're 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 just like a revenue bond, or excuse me, a geo bond. They're traded all muni bonds. All muni bonds trade over the counter. Secondary market. That's right. Well, you got to be tighter than that. Over the counter means there's a bond desk, and there are bond desks are buying the muni bonds into inventory and selling them out of inventory. We buy them at the bid and we sell them at the offer price. Very Tesla, my minimum spread I'm ever going to make it. So that is no different than it's a developer bond, how it's traded. It's traded through a bond desk inventory, markup, markdown. And my minimum spread is going to be test question an eighth. The minimum spread when trading munis is an eighth. If I work the bond desk, I'm telling you, I'm the guy at Wells Fargo or, or Morgan Stanley or Merrill Lynch is buying mini bonds into our inventory at the bid and selling them out of our inventory at the offer price. So mm -hmm. that's how they all trade. That's how they all trade. By the way, over the counter is important because some things trade in an exchange where they're matching buyers and sellers. That's not how munis trade. We're not matching buyers and sellers. You're calling a bond desk and asking for a quote. Right? I say, hey, how about these uh, uh, Salt Lake City Olympic Organizing Committee double barrel bonds? And he says, my bid is and my offer is, and then I can decide whether I'm a buyer or seller, what that means to me. All right, anything else? Okay, I will see you for the next uh, event, which will be Tuesday live stream uh, overtime session and the next office hour. I'm putting the office hours every other week. And if we fill them up, uh, we had three people today. So we have five, I'll, I'll you know, add them as we need them. So, all right, everybody, uh, see you next time. Thank you, Dean. All right, bye-bye.